Will Oxley, navigator aboard Ichiban, uh, fantastic result, well done. Thank you, yeah, pretty happy about it. Happy indeed, enough that uh, just shortly after the presentation uh, you decided to volunteer to dive in before you got pushed in. I wouldn't say, it was, it, was a, it was a voluntary dive or an involuntary push, so I had two choices. I was the sacrificial lamb for Matt. This was a pretty challenging race for different reasons this year. Tell us a little bit about what the main challenges were. Yeah, so we, we, we had the two high pressure systems, one in the Tasman and one uh, in the Gulf, and so you get a, a, a trough line between the two. And so the challenges were getting firstly through that first trough line and then dealing with some uh, light winds and then uh, just hard reaching, then running, and then uh, getting around Tasman. Uh, it was also very complicated because the second of the sort of troughs had come through and so there were uh, it was a very tricky uh, and also quite stressful part of the race there where um, we couldn't cover uh, the boats that were fast approaching behind because we couldn't get across to the breeze in the northern side of Storm Bay and we had to um, pin our hopes on the southerly which we could see and we could see the white caps in the distance and so we had to sail to it and uh, so that was also a very important part of the race. And uh, this is the dilemma I guess isn't it for you, you're dealing with weather, you're dealing with strategy, you're also dealing with tactics so presumably you're sort of two or three of you there in the afterguards are really trying to work out how we best placed for the weather and also how we're making sure we're not out on a limb with the others, yeah? Yeah it was an interesting time because unfortunately I had uh, uh, the satcoms went down <laughs> so I had no new weather for that whole period so not only did, was I not getting the weather I couldn't actually see the tracker so uh, we could see some boats on AIS and we could see the sky and we had the historical stuff and the old group files so I just sort of made a story with that and wiggled, wiggled through but um, we have long discussions in the lead up and, and every day in the week leading up I'm running routes and looking at the models and which one's performing better and why, uh, how well they're dealing with the features as they develop because the patterns sort of repeat and um, so it was clear in everyone's mind what we were trying to achieve and what the numbers were when we were going to jibe and how we were going to approach it so there wasn't actually that much discussion but it was just okay it's getting close I reckon we're 20 minutes away now we're 10 now okay everyone happy we're going sort of now's the time yes um, but it's a very strong afterguard uh, led by Gordon and Matt and then we've got Anthony Merrington youngster uh, as the strategist and we've got Rob Greenhouse who of course um, is very solid and he and I have done a lot of sailing together on various boats this year and you talked about a lot of preparation. In fact, the two words that I hear constantly around this boat is research and analysis. Tell us a little bit about the long range stuff. So you're obviously dealing in the weeks and months perhaps before the race with all of sort of what's going on in the pattern. But what, what, about, what are you doing in the longer frame in terms of selection of sails and other things? Tell us a bit about that. Yes, yeah, so the, the first thing is, um, I, I would say for me, 80% of the race is done by the time we hit the start line. And, and that's a genuine figure that um, it's just the last 20% to actually execute <laughs> everything we've done. But in terms of uh, sail selection and the planning, we uh, use the K&D, Sailing Performance Software, which is excellent. And essentially we have um, sensors on everything in the boat and we're logging data every second. And then uh, if, if you want me to go into detail, so we then break those into uh, one minute or 30 second segments and um, we discard those that are, that are bad and then we build up a whole uh, database of um, those bins and then we look at the sales that we had up and we focus on particular areas that we think where's a crossover between sales and uh, we decide which sale is performing well at which angle. So then we end up with a sail chart where we've got too many sails and we can't take them all so then we focus on what are the overlaps, which sail can cover for, for which and so uh, and we keep drilling that down um, till we make a final decision on which sails to take. But so that that's we've basically spent the whole year doing that. 
And am I right in saying too, I was talking to Gordon earlier about um, the sales now in terms of the sort of area, extra area of projection you've got and so on. Are the, are the crossovers also longer? Does that make that easier now? Uh, the crossovers are, 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 are getting wider, but um, every sale still has a sweet spot. So you then have to focus on uh, how much time you think you're going to spend in those sweet spots. And a polar, when, you know, to be technical, they're nice curves, but of course they're not curves, they're very spiky. And so you, once you've decided on the sales that you're going to use, you then have to sail those sweet spots. So you, there are plenty of points in the polar where you can't sail. So you sail on the sweet spot for, say, the J0 or a reaching sail, and then you pick the point at which you are going to change to a soft sail and bear away. And so you spend the whole time making sure that you're sailing as fast as you can with the right sail until it's not the right sail, then you change. And um, it uh, is a lot of work, but uh, the results uh, speak for themselves.